everyone. Uh, my name is Mary Ann Rockwell, and I'm a librarian I'm at Saratoga Springs Public Library. I'm talking today during our Poets Talk Poetry webcast with David Graham, who's a local poet. David um, is um, has recently taught, actually taught for many years at Ripon University, and has relocated to um, this area where he grew up um, and is from originally. He's going to read a couple of poems by other folks and uh, then he's going to read one of his own poems. And David, is there anything you'd like to add to, anything else we need to know about you before we get started? Well, the, the one thing I do need to mention is the poem I will be reading by me is from my very recently published book called The Honey of Earth uh, from Terrapin Books. It came out last year. And uh, I want you all to appreciate especially the cover, which uh, is a painting uh, done by my wife, Lee Shippey. Uh, and uh, it, uh, it it's a beautiful painting. I tell everyone... Please judge this book by its cover. <laughs> so uh, that's my plug. Very good. Thank you. And that, that's my, I had meant to mention your book, so I'm glad you brought that up. So you'll be reading from Schubertina by Thomas Transtromer. Yes. First. Ready? Ready. Uh, this is a poem by the Nobel Prize winner, uh, Tomas. Trans uh originally published in 1978. And it's a fairly lengthy poem, uh, uh, especially for him. But uh, I wanted to read section four because that does uh, connect to the poem uh, of my own that uh, Marianne uh, asked me to select. And uh, you'll see why later. Anyway, uh, the poem is... Uh, kind of an organized around uh, the, the uh, uh, piece of music that uh, is mentioned uh, later in the poem by Franz Schubert. Uh, so and it's called Schubertiana. And uh, he's kind of meditating on uh, the power of music, which I think also uh, expands outward to the powers of art and imagination as well. Anyway, this is section four of a uh, five-section poem. So much we have to trust to be able to live our daily day without sinking through the earth. Trust the masses of snow that cling to the mountainsides above the village. Trust promises to keep silent, that the understanding smile. Trust that the telegram about the accident doesn't refer to us and the sudden explo from within doesn't come. Trust the axles that carry us on the highway in the middle of the 300 times enlarged steel bee swarm. But none of that is really worth our confidence. The quintet says that we can trust something else. What else? Something else. And it follows us a little of the way there. Like when the light goes out on the stairs and the hand follows with confidence the blind banister that finds its way in the darkness. Thank you so much. Um, so what I noticed about the, the poem in its entirety, Schubert Kiana, is that it kind of deals with the macrocosm and the microcosm, like the, the vastness of the particulars of the universe and how we can only ever focus on one thing at a time. And maybe that's kind of the existential leap that the poem makes for us or on our behalf. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a beautiful image at the beginning where uh, the speaker, presumably Tronstromer himself, is uh, across the river from Manhattan, from New York City, and he's looking at it at night, and he just says, uh, the giant city there is a long, flickering drift 
a spiral galaxy from the side. So that's the macro. Uh, mm -hmm. And then he zeroes in and said uh, to, you know, what's happening in all those millions of households uh, yeah. at that very moment when he's looking, he's imagining it. Uh, and uh, he decides that someone, there are 8 million people, someone must now be playing Franz Schubert. Yes, among all of those people, there's got to be someone listening to a Schubert quintet playing and just thinking only of the music there. Um, and, um, and so that's part of that is just trusting, um, kind of invoking trust for, um, well, whatever, whatever we're dealing with at the moment, like that, that will come out the other end of it, I suppose, you know, um, I notice he and has, he, very, he, uh... he has very long kind of Whitman-esque lines. He's very, it would be almost like prose if it weren't so quirky. He has this quirky thing, um, if if you know what I mean. I, I think it, it yeah, is I do. a quirkiness that makes it the idiosyncratic thing that makes it poetry rather than prose. Yeah, and uh, he began his career writing very, very short things. Uh, I think his first book was called something like 17 Poems, which is pretty short for a book of poems. And uh, later in his career, he expanded a little bit. Uh, but he did it in, this, in the same way as in Schubertiana, generally, uh, by writing these short sections. And then uh, they're almost like movements of the symphony. Uh, the, He'll establish a theme and then kind of recur and try it in different keys and so forth. Um, I understand that he himself was an amateur mu musician. And so he frequently refers to to music as a as a kind of parallel art. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like an ekphrastic thing, the way he deals with music. Um. I think he does the same with painting sometimes. Um, and he was also a, psycho a psychologist. That's how he made his living, really, as a psychologist or psychiatrist. Yeah. yeah. There's a hauntedness, I think, about his stuff sometimes, too. Yeah, I, I love his work a lot. And, uh, uh, there's a mystery always in it. Uh, it reminds me of that that wonderful uh, image in Robert Frost. Uh, in one of his essays, Frost says that uh, uh, the poem is like a piece of ice on a hot stove, and it rides on its own melting. And there's that sense of uh, when the poem is over, it kind of vanishes in a way uh, into the reader um, and there's a mystery there's a elusiveness always that I think uh, Frost believes a good poem had to have and, and I see the same thing throughout uh, Trans Tromer's work um, he like Robert Bly that we'll talk about shortly um, he was very open to dream and myth and the unconscious and uh, all those uh, things that cannot be pinned down rationally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's what, even in spite of his very long kind of conversational lines, um, that thing distinguishes it as poetry. I mean, that's where, you know, that's the marker for me. Now you're going to read um, a poem by Robert Bly, right? I am. Yeah, great. Um, this one, uh, just a, a tiny bit of introduction. Uh, Robert Bly was, uh, he published this in 19, or excuse me, 2011, I believe, when he was, um, 
in his 80s, I guess. He's still, he's still with us, uh, though he's no longer writing. And uh, he was uh, trying to write an American version of the Persian form, the guzzle, uh, which has become quite popular among American poets. And uh, he makes a lot of radical changes uh, to the form um, in the original languages, Arabic and Urdu and Persian. Uh, it's always in couplets. Mm -hmm. And there's a very strict uh, meter, I'm told, as well as a, uh, as a rhyming uh, sequence. And uh, also... Uh, at the uh, end of each couplet, uh, you repeat the same word or phrase. And that's about the only thing that Robert Bly picked up on. He, he changed to, to uh, three line stanzas and his repetition is there, but it's irregular. Anyway, he wrote a whole series of these uh, poems that uh, were quite different in, in some ways from what he uh, had, had done earlier. And uh, I was reading this particular poem, which I'm going to present, and uh, was struck particularly by the line, most of the time we live through the night, which uh, I stole and made the title of, of one of my own poems. Well, they say, they say uh, great poets steal, right? That's what we do. So. <laughs> right. Somebody said that. I like to quote... Uh, Pete Seeger's father, I love to quote him. Apparently he said, plagiarism is basic to all culture. <laughs> Let's hear now that I'm no longer a professor of English, I don't have to worry about plagiarism. <laughs> okay, this is Robert Bly, The Sympathies of the Long Married. Oh, well, let's go on eating the grains of eternity. What do we care about improvements in travel? Angels sometimes cross the river on old turtles. Shall we worry about who gets left behind? That one bird flying through the clouds is enough. Your sweet face at the house, excuse me, your sweet face at the door of the house is enough. The two farm horses stubbornly pull the wagon. The mad crows carry away the tablecloth. Most of the time, we live through the night. Let's not drive the wild angels from our door. Maybe the mad fields of grain will move. Maybe the troubled rocks will learn to walk. It's all right if we're troubled by the night. It's all right if we can't recall our own name. It's all right if this rough music keeps on playing. I've given up worrying about men living alone. I do worry about the couple who live next door. <laughs> Some words heard in the screen door are enough. Another great poem. Oh, I, I think I forgot to. I think I forgot to say the most important thing about the guzzle form is that each couplet in the original or, or triplet in Bly uh, is separate. Uh, it has a different subject, but uh, the idea is that somehow the reader completes the poem by, by uh, discerning the, the theme that runs through all these very different uh, stanzas. Mm -hmm. And that, so the refrain at the, the second line, at the end of the second couplet, is the unifying thing with these disparate elements that kind of organizes them a little bit. And I, I remember yeah. reading that the, the guzzle in Arabic countries, when it's performed, it's almost like a spoken word thing, and the audience will join in on the second line, kind of like with enthusiasm. So it's a very spirited event when it's read in public. But um, this, this poem, I, you know, it's interesting. I'm glad you pointed out that it was inspired by a gazelle, because I a guzzle, um, but I was feeling like there was some kind of a form with a repetition in it. For example, I love how um, the angels, first the angels sometimes cross the river on old turtles, which is so kind of 
weird and kind of mythic in itself. But then the angels later on are repeated and they're mad angels. Uh, let's not drive the wild or wild angels. Let's not drive the wild angels from the door. And then also kind of weirdly interesting is the initial line. Let's go on eating the grains of eternity. And then it, that's repeated with maybe the mad fields of grain will move. So he has this really nice um, kind of way he he jumbled up the words. It's like he gave himself a palette of these these many words that he would have to reuse or something. Yes, uh, and a lot of the imagery, of course, is drawn from uh, his experience, his life living in rural uh, Minnesota. He grew up on a farm, and so his poems from start to finish are all full of plows and uh, farm animals and crows uh, uh, flying over the cornfields. And so he loves that natural imagery. Uh, the other thing I noticed was in the opening stanza, he's alluding to a famous passage by William Blake, uh, the great romantic poet. I see the grain, I see the world in a grain of sand and heaven in a wild flower. Um, yeah. And so he plays oh, on that yeah. kind, of, uh, that kind of literary illusion as well as the the rural imagery. You know, I didn't catch that. So thanks for for mentioning that. This is why conversations about poetry can help us understand the poem better, right? Um, and what do you say? I have to. I have to say. Excuse me. I have to say that I don't understand this poem uh, completely, <laughs> right. or maybe even very much. But uh, Bly believes, and I think Tronstromer does too, that uh, as I as I mentioned earlier, in a many a, a great poem, there's something deeply uh, elusive and mysterious that you you could feel, but you can't pin down. I agree. Uh, and and we feel it's only available to the conscious. I agree with you. I think that um, we're moved by poems because of how they make us feel more than it's not a intellectual exercise, really. However, it is, I think it's helpful to kind of glean what we can from a poem by talking about it, I find, by doing a close reading. Oh, I agree. Yeah. I agree for completely. I wanted I love that image in the trust poem of the follow the hand following the banister down the stairs after the light goes out. Mm -hmm. Which for me is a kind of an image for this process that we we're talking about. Uh, you kind of trust the art, you trust the poet, you trust the musician that uh, you're going somewhere even if you're not sure and maybe the poet isn't quite sure where they're going uh you just trust them and follow them right we just you just need a little bit of light to follow with you don't need a lot of light um and uh what do you do you see a correlation between the po these two poems any kind of relationship you could draw between these two poems? Well, uh, when you asked me to, to uh, uh, present a poem by my, uh, uh, one of my own poems that connected to another poem, uh, I immediately thought of this uh, uh, poem by Robert Bly because I had actually used one of his lines as a title of a poem in my most recent book. And I thought of that immediately. And I, and then I started pondering what I might say and what I might uh, uh, talk about. And then, then I remembered that uh, when I wrote the poem, it was not conscious on my part, but I obviously remembered that passage in Tronstromer as well. And mm -hmm. interestingly, Robert Bly and, and Tronstromer were lifelong friends. And Bly, mm -hmm. uh, I first discovered Tronstromer in Bly's translations. Uh, of his work. And I think there there's often um, these these Eastern European and Swedish 
poets, they might be fluent in English, but they write, I think they tend to write in their own language. And then someone, they rely on a trusted translator. So I could see how they would develop a friendship if he was relying on trusting, that is, you know, Robert Bly to translate for him well. Um, so great. Yeah, there's a, I have not read it. I have not read it, but there's a book uh, called Airmail, uh, which collects Bly's letters to and from Tranströmer over decades. Uh, I'm interested to see uh, what you might learn from that uh, from that book uh, once I get my hands on it. Um, I met I've met Tranströmer. Uh, he he's passed on, of course, but uh, he was fluent in English. Right. But uh, he relied he relied on Robert Bly to make the poem sound good to an English, to a native uh, English speaking audience. Mm -hmm. Because he's probably, he may be fluent in English, but his home, his native tongue is Swedish. So it would be natural for him to write poetry right. in his own language. So shall we hear your poem now? Most of the time we look. Yes, indeed. Great. Um, I guess I don't have to say anything in, uh, introduction of this uh, title is from Robert Bly, of course. Most of the time we live through the night. Most of the time the dark waters will rise, then fall into sun and bird song, everything glistening, vivid as broken glass and fresh mud. Most of the time the dire phone does not ring. Your brakes hold firm, fever breaks. Letter arrives in plenty of time with a full amount enclosed. Most of the time, when we speak our love, we mean it. When you walk the winter cemetery and 50 crows lift off at once from a bare oak, most of the time it portends nothing at all. Just a bit of dust moving around the universe. Just another omen that means nothing really but what water means flowing over stones in the creek. Most of the time, Sunday has little to tell Saturday night, and almost nothing Monday morning needs to hear. The best days are the first days to flee, said Virgil, long ago. But we didn't listen, did we? We ran through summer grass and winter snow, and most of the time, that was just the right thing to do. That's great. Thank you. So in your poem and in, and in Bly's poem and in, um, to some extent in Trans Traumer's poem, um, I see humor, like a humor and a plain spokenness um, in all three, which I like very much. Um, and I, and this poem, I'm also seeing that holding together the disparate elements of the world. There's a lot of naming of things in here that you do um, of disparate things. Um, but then there's that invocation again uh, to trust, just trust what is kind of. Can you talk about uh, yeah, there's a, how you yeah, feel about home? Uh, when I came across that line by Robert Bly, it really hit me, and I wrote it down in my journal, and uh, later that day decided I would base a poem on that prompt. And I think the reason it hit me is uh, my wife and I often talk about this, especially at stressful times. Uh, we quote to each other uh, a wonderful phrase that Thelonious Monk used as a title of one of his pieces which was worry later <laughs> when, when one of us is really stressed out and, and, you know, gripped by worry, the other one will say, that's good. You can worry, but just worry later. <laughs> and, uh, you know, reminding ourselves that worry doesn't really help. It's, you know, as, as they say, it, uh, it doesn't do anything about tomorrow and just ruins today. Uh, and so most of the time, things do turn out okay. And you live uh, through the night, too. <laughs> um, 
So I, I kind of riffed, I kind of riffed on that uh, idea, and uh, I it was in the back of my mind, I guess, but I wasn't conscious of it. That passage in Tronstrover that's somewhat similar, uh, mm -hmm. although he takes it in a different direction. He talks about uh, how we trust all these things in the physical world, and they're not worthy of our trust. You mm -hmm. can't trust them because. The, the snow will avalanche down on you sometime and so on. And mm -hmm. uh, the the axle will break and, and you'll be in an accident. Uh, all, and, and I kind of took that and reversed it uh, following Bly and said, well, yeah, that can happen. I guess it does. But most of the time it won't. Uh -huh. So kind of a more optimistic take on what Tronstrober said. Yeah, he, he, he definitely embraces the darkness in his work a lot um, and looks for that, almost looks, seeks out the ghostly things, um, Transformer. But this is, is more cheerful and more, yeah, I would agree, more optimistic. Um, up, I just wrote here, Carpe Diem. There's a lot of toward the end. And I like that you, you know, you quote Virgil and you just kind of throw it away. Like, but we didn't listen, did we? It's very conversational and approachable. Um, There's a, I have a memory uh, that sticks in my mind. I, I was in, I think seventh grade. Mm -hmm. And uh, one, one of our teachers was disgusted by how lazy we were. We weren't working up to our potential, et cetera. And, you know, I'm sure he was right. Uh, and he, he essentially read us a poem, a Carpe Diem poem, mm -hmm. to try to uh, get our attention and, and make us see the error of our ways. And I remember nobody was convinced by this poem. And then uh, when I was writing this one, I, I guess that memory floated into my head because I, I thought, well, Kids never listen to adults. When <laughs> don't you they, have a poem, they give us have a poem about, I'm sorry, didn't mean to interrupt, but you have a poem about this very event, right? Where your teacher, nobody's listening and he's talking about Yates and nobody's getting it. And they cry, don't, they cry at the end of the class or something. And so that's in this book. Yeah, different. Right? Different Two. teacher in that case, but oh, okay. uh, same idea. Similar thing. So one of the things, I, it's not really uh, explicit in this poem of mine here, but one of the things I often think about is how different uh, uh, adults look at the world than from the way children do. And I think many adults have a sentimentalized view that children are innocent and they don't worry about things the same way. And, and you know, it's our job to preserve their innocence. And uh, I don't really remember uh, feeling that same sense of innocence when I was a kid. But the main thing is uh, that, that this poem touches on is adults really uh, want kids to savor being children, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and adults know that the best days are the first to flee. In other words, time... Uh, uh, is fleeting and, and uh, adults often feel that uh, those were the best days of your life and you should appreciate it, kid. And mm -hmm. every kid I know just wants to grow up and get their driver's license mm -hmm. and independence and, and so on. They don't really listen when adults tell them things like that. Yes. And <laughs> for the purposes of this poem, I decided, well, that's all, that's right. They shouldn't worry about that. They should just go on doing what they're doing, being kids. Mm -hmm. And I believe that there's, they can experience intense pain in a different way being children, although they might have appreciate uh, the moment of euphoria in a different way than we do um, as adults. Um, but we'll, we will trust that most of the time the dire phone does not ring. I just wanted to say that I really like the dire phone, like like it's a wall phone somewhere that's the, like the hotline to direness or something. I, so I just um, appreciate that humor too. 
Um, any other, any final things you want to share with us? Uh, I, I will say just uh, a couple things about how this poem came to be. Mm -hmm. uh, I often do this uh, when I'm uh, starting out in the morning, opening my journal, getting ready to write something. Uh, I'll read some poet or poem that I love just to kind of get the juices flowing, get inspired. And sometimes, not always, but sometimes I will actually take a poem by someone else as a prompt and just go. And what I love to do is not plan anything and just let it uh, flow like that piece of ice on a hot stove and just see what happens. So I have to say, I have no idea how Virgil got in the end of this poem. <laughs> it was a big surprise to me. Uh, and, and often when I revise, I take out those tangents mm -hmm. uh, that I find in my journal. I just freely write. And then if it, if it doesn't work, I take it out, of course. But in this case, I thought there's a weird way in which, and I'm not sure I can explain it, but I, I think Virgil belongs here mm -hmm. uh, in, this, in this particular poem. Sure. Um. I just wanted to, one more question I have is, um, do you subscribe to any uh, form, like a poetic form? Because I know you have quatrain, like the four lines here, four line verses here. So was there any other rhyming uh, you were adhering to with this? I uh, am not very big on end rhyme, mm -hmm. and I don't think I'm very good at it. Mm -hmm. So I try to smuggle in a lot of, uh, I call it chiming, a lot of sound play within the lines, a lot of assonance and consonants and all the rest. And uh, it is very important to me how this poem sounds out loud. I, I go by by that uh, 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 more than what it looks like on the page. But when when I can, I like a nice little tidy poem on the page. So that's why... I, I thought the, the four line stanzas in this one worked okay, but it's free verse. Yeah. But even the prob probably the constraint of the four lines of kind of the same length um, help you to, sometimes you're inviting something unexpected in when you restrain yourself in a, a poetic form um, that you don't I think expect. That's, yeah, that's a very good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And, and uh, the other thing I was, in, 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 as long as we're talking about form, uh, mm -hmm. the the rhythmic repetition uh, and the syntactical repetition is also a, a kind of form. So I had that phrase from Bly most of the time that becomes a kind of a, a drum beat uh, that's repeated and organizes the poem sonically, mm -hmm. even if it's not a traditional meter. Right, I think this is what we use in free verse in, in modern poetry, such devices as a repetition of a phrase, as, which I meant to mention, um, I noted that before. So, well, this has been great, great uh, talking to you and um, thanks so much for your time. And we sure. will try to do another webcast next month, Poets Talk Poetry. And put it on our, this will be available on our Facebook page, um, hopefully sometime tomorrow afternoon. And we'll also um, post all three poems up for you to actually read while you listen to the conversation and to David reading. And you can buy David's book, Honey of the Earth. And we have it here, we have it at the library, and I've taken it out. So. Thank you very much, David. You can't get it at the library until she brings it back. That's right. That's right. All right. Thanks so much. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks very much, Marianne. That was an honor. Okay. Take care.